You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. This is Trevor Wade. I'm Coonhound Program Manager here at UKC. And I'm joined today by Alan Gingrich, the director of Hunting Ops. How you doing, Alan? Good, good. Just back from Fourth of July vacation. One day, <laughs> one day. But it's good to have a day off the middle of the week, huh? Yeah, it was good yeah. celebrating the independence, and uh, we had some good weather and good fellowship. Warm. with Everybody seemed like warm yesterday on the fourth. It was very warm here. Probably the hottest day we've had so far here in Michigan. We went and watched an air show, and. Uh, phew, that was they had those uh they they sent off those fire bombs or whatever they call them man these those things throw off a lot of heat uh, but yeah i sat out there like a like an old man with an umbrella over the top of my head keeping the sun off me. <laughs> yeah <laughs> otherwise i was going to be fried i think it's been hot and dry we could still use some more rain but hopefully we get a little bit this week looks yeah, like but yeah we've been getting a little bit so that's helping yeah Yep, absolutely. Well, hey, we this past uh, past couple months, we've been focused on uh, interviewing different folks. Obviously, it's just the time of year it was. We were on the road a lot, and we were doing a lot of uh, event results and highlighting winners and highlighting dogs. But today, we're getting back to to something that I know all the listeners like, and that's talking about rules. Yeah, you mentioned that that was going to be the topic today, so I'm looking forward to that. Talk. Yeah. I always like to talk about rules, but I did read through some of yours, and you picked some toughies here. Hey, you well, put us on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got finished writing my advisor column for next month's magazine, and I talked about, you know, sometimes writing a, a weekly or a monthly advisor column. I, you did it for I don't know, fifteen, twenty years, and that's that's hard to come up with topics. It is new ones that we haven't yeah. used before, right? That's yeah. right. And it seems like always after the travel season and when you're at the at the breed day events, you get a lot of questions. Yeah. And sometimes I can kind of uh, just breathe some life into you and give yeah. you some new perspectives and and different rule interpretations to discuss on here so yeah you know what i find interesting with that is you know i've done it for a long time you know a lot of years but we have the advisor books that we've had we have had a couple editions of those and um they they had to be updated every five ten years or so because of rule changes and something might be in there that's not 100 percent accurate anymore because of a rule change you know um but the, the thing that's interesting to me is still today, we have the same answers for most everything that we had even 20 years ago, 20 right. years ago and longer than that. Yeah. You know, the first advisor book uh, was one that basically everything in there was were things that Todd Kellum wrote, you know, and even most of those things are still actor or, or accurate today. Yeah. That's real. Those past advisor yeah. books and, and the website are great avenues for resources to go back and, and look at rules. Obviously yeah. there's a few subtle changes, but like you said, the, the, the whole basic of them are, yeah, are pretty similar. Sometimes, you know, you're probably the same way, but sometimes I kind of question a little bit. I'm not sure I would agree with that, but that's the way that it's always been, you know, and we've always ruled it that way and, and have always continued to do that. But, uh, so it's all it's always interesting when you hear every now and then you hear one that you've not ever heard before that right. we may not have written about, but that happens so very seldom, right? You know, because and usually and often and I get it. You think, uh, man, this is one that you just don't hardly ever hear of. But guess what? It's probably happened in these thirty, twenty five, thirty years that we've been writing advisor columns. You know, and we probably have an answer to go back to. Just so. when you think you have everything covered, they'll be come a hunt, come along and prove you wrong. <laughs> I know, sure. that's true too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we kind of, I've been compiling some different questions and we're kind of going to do this like a mailbag sort of thing. You know, okay. this is questions that we've gotten over the phone or by email or even in person, some of them. And I don't know, we have, I think we have seven questions that we're going to go okay. through today. And yeah. then uh, when we're done with that, we're going to talk about uh, the tournament champion qualifying year at the halfway point. So that'll be a little fun thing to do too, to yeah. highlight some specific dogs and so I'm going to need my reading glasses for this, right? We'll have to do some reading. We'll have to read some questions off. So maybe some rules. So All it might right. be handy. Don't guess at it. Don't guess. <laughs> but uh, hey, we'll start out with question number one here. Uh, question number one reads, can you be scratched for delaying the cast if you're the only one left in the one dog cast? Yeah. You know, delaying the cast gets used incorrectly often. 
And, you know, it, it, that's been the case when I first started, and we still see it. You know, for somebody that's uh, maybe entered a dog in the hunt and he's not there yet or somebody else entered him or something, well, we got to give him an hour for delaying the cast. Right. Or maybe some other scenario, we got to give him an hour for delaying the cast. The one and only time where delaying the cast comes into play is during your actual hunt. Once you've got your, where you're out hunting and during that hunt time, when you call time out, after you call time out, you have to give everybody in your party, every, every handler, you got to give them one hour to return to a meeting place to continue on with the cast. That is the one and only time that rule that speaks about delaying the cast. That's the only time that rule comes into play. So to answer your question, rule 6E is where you're going to find that. And it reads this, dogs will be scratched for delaying completion of cast for one hour after timeout is called during the hunt in accordance with rule 7. Now, rule 7 talks all about the different reasons that you can call timeout. Right. So it's only during that where that one hour delay of cast comes in. So there's a key word in that sentence. It says... Uh, dog will be scratched for delaying completion of cast. So that completion is is kind of a key word in this, not just delaying the cast. Because the question here that you read is, can the cast be can it, can you be scratched if you are the only one left in a cast? And the answer to that by the rule is yes, you can because it's we're talking about the completion of your cast. Doesn't matter if there's one dog or four. Right. And there's no that room that rule doesn't leave any. Room for interpretation, really. There's no yeah. exceptions or, or caveats listed in there. It's just right. black and white. It and is we what can it is. make the argument, you know, that, hey, we're not uh, delaying anybody else but ourselves at this point. But, uh, uh, yeah, you are delaying. The rule doesn't say delaying everybody else. It says delaying the completion of the cast. So with that would be, that's where we get that from. Yeah. Who, whoever your guide or your judge or your uh, master of hounds that not may think otherwise, yeah. but yeah, yeah, there's more people out there than just you. Yeah. But, okay. So yeah. So there, you know, that rule doesn't leave any, any, uh, uh room for interpretations as, and there's no exceptions or anything, uh, no unfortunate breaks or anything like that, but that delaying the completion of the cast is what's key here. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, you'll move on to question two. Or yeah, you want to? Yeah, uh, no, I think that's, me that's this one here. about as can't. I don't think we can drill that any harder than that. Yeah. But like I said, whether we don't, uh, even you and I don't always agree with all of our rules, and that all that doesn't matter. But we just try to be consistent. So yeah, so yeah, that's uh, question number two. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, let you answer this one. I'll read the question. I'll okay. let you take the first crack well, at this one. I think reading this question may be longer than the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the question. So I pull my dog off of a tree after scoring it and recast towards the other dogs in the cast. Shortly after I cut loose, another dog in the cast was treed. So obviously, I think became, or came treed uh, before I was able to strike my dog. My dog got struck and covered the treeing hound after the tree was already closed. While the cast was en route to the tree, we heard a commotion at the tree. After arriving, we realized the hounds had pulled a coon out of a hole at the base of the tree. I know the declared hound will re now receive plus strike points and have its tree points deleted. I am under the impression that since I was shut out on the tree... With the coon being caught, I could get my strike points plus now. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, hey, this is this is one that actually popped up at Blue Tick Days for me. I think I had three or four people the the morning after asking me about this question. So I thought, hey, let's let's answer it. And it can it was fresh on my mind because it came off episode forty four. If you revert back to episode forty four, me and you talked about holes and how to score holes in different scenarios. And it's something you don't think about a lot. Yep. And the same can be said for caught coons. You know, you don't catch a ton of coons on cast. We have we hunt tree hounds. Most times, and, and in our rule book a lot, it refers to everything as tree and uh, pulling a dog off a tree and, and that sort of thing. But uh, I, I think uh, we can kind of talk about this using that language and, and tell you what the, the UKC interpretation is of the rules. So um, let's, let's think about that discussion we had about scoring holes. And if a dog can be uh, shut out on a strike for a hole, then we have to be able to assume that a dog can also be shut out um, on a caught coon. And basically what what the shutout means is that you're shut out on the track where that dog or where that dog ended its track that you're shut out on, whether that dog that shuts you out is on a tree in a hole on a fence post, you know, in a barn or a cocoon even. 
you would still shut out on that specific track, and that's where your strike points are going to get deleted regardless. Right. But there's one thing that shuts you out, and that is if that dog was declared treed before you were declared struck. It's that declared treed that, that creates the shutout. Yep. So sometimes, just be, sometimes in some cases with a hole, just so we don't confuse folks, you know, if there's a, a you can go to dogs that are in a hole even without declaring them treed. And in that case, you know, we have a rule that we're getting sideways a little bit, but any dogs that were declared treed get strike and tree points both. Right. Dogs uh, declared struck strike points only. But if, if no dog is declared st- treed in a hole or whatever, that does not, that, then it doesn't, cre- it won't create a shutout ever because no dog is declared treed. But in the case of a dog is treed, declared treed in a hole, that creates the shutout. And if that was the case, that will, uh, that will uh, create dogs to be sure have dogs being shut out potentially. Right. So there is a difference. Right. Sometimes you can be shut out and sometimes you can't. Right. So, so in this case of the question, the dog is shut out and let's just yep. go over some, uh, some rules to maybe circle or underline in your rule book that pertain yep. to this. Yep. Uh, the first one's going to be rule five. I, and that's going to be under the deleted point section. It reads uh, points will be deleted when dog that is shut out comes into tree shut out on um, tree obviously there and, and what we've wrote about in the past tree could be uh could often off could also be called end of track is is what we're what i'm trying the point i'm trying to get to yeah. there so the dog comes in to to uh the place where the track was ended that it shut out on with the other dog being declared tree then you're going to be shut out there and you're going to get your strike points del- deleted even if it's not a tree if it's end of track somewhere brush pile caught coon what have you uh, there's other set. There's other instances that it's uh, put in the rule book. Uh, just for your reference here, Rule Three E under plus points says dogs that are shut out must still be declared struck. So that's an important thing. Even then, you need to strike your dog. Um, they are eligible for tree points if they are declared treed within the three minutes that this dog wasn't. If they are shut, if they are at tree shut out on when judge arrives, strike points are deleted. Um, again tree we say tree we hunt tree hounds but end of track there is also what we're talking about and uh I, that's i mean it's that's just the it, you might be getting caught up on the language a little bit but yeah. we're telling you now that a caught coon is end of track shows in the track so your strike points are going to be deleted in this instance yeah and there was a uh, obviously a dog that was declared treed so that's what constitutes the shutout for anybody else that was not declared struck yeah. but uh yeah so you can in fact be shut out in a hole if one of the dogs was declared treat in that hole. Yeah. And uh, don't get caught up too, ma- too much on the fact that you thought the dogs were originally treed. What matters is when you get in there. If yeah. they've already pulled it out of that tree, then you can't, you can't, tre- you can't score what you think. You have yeah. to score what you see. Yeah, and in that case, we're going to call it not scored as a, as a caught coon. But it doesn't change the fact that a dog was, in fact, declared treed and another dog was shut out. Yep. Okay. Perfect. And that's why judges always, when, like, if, if I'm judging and you've, you've – hear a lot of judges say that if a dog is already sitting in their declared treat or what have you, another dog, another handler strikes his dog and they'll say, yep, I'll take your call with a line under it. Exactly. That reason for that line under it is in case that dog is, ends up treed with the dog that shut it off. Yeah. Specifically just a little reminder on that more tree. than anything. Yep. That's right. Well, I think we covered those those two pretty well. Let's move on to question number three. That's yeah. one that's a little debatable, and you're going to have guys say, well, that's, that doesn't sound right, but that just kind of goes along with that's consistent with it's being consistent with the way the, the verbiage is in the rules. Yep. If you're shut out, you're shut out. There's no exceptions. All right, moving on to question number three. It says, what constitutes a dog leaving the tree? I've seen judges minus dogs for dropping off the tree and daring to put its nose on the ground for a few seconds. Handlers will want it minus immediately for leaving the tree, even though the dog got right back on the tree and continued treeing. My thoughts are so long as they continue treeing and don't take a track and leave there, there should be no minus. Is this the judge's call or is there a standard to go by? Yeah, there's a standard to go by. And I I think it all depends on... uh... If you want to go by that standard or if you're looking for things to get you uh, demerited, I guess. It's a good way to for other handlers to, hey, we need to minus that dog. You know, right. I mean, they might be a little quick to that sometimes. But I think common sense, being reasonable and using common sense goes a long way. So why do we minus dogs for leaving a tree or, or what constitutes leaving a tree? So obviously the dog has to be doing one of a couple things. Either they're treeing by showing treed in some form of action either by sitting there barking is the most 
the most common, obviously. Uh, but leaving a tree. So when a dog leaves a tree, what is it doing? What is it doing? We have a rule that says they can come back to the handler uh, so long as they turn around and go back and tree satisfactorily. And that is the judge's decision whether they're treed satisfactorily. Oftentimes, that's not that hard to determine. Right. Uh, the problem is sometimes when they come back, oftentimes or sometimes a dog will, while they're running, all depends how far it is, they might put their nose close to the ground or to the ground or what have you. Uh, that alone does not, does not constitute the dog left. Uh, that just says the dog put its nose down, but it's what it does when it does that. So there's another thing is if, it, if a dog takes off and is opening and maybe trailing away from the tree, that's considered leaving the tree, right. left the tree. Another one is where it's maybe not opening, but just sniffing around over here, over there, not showing tree, sniffing around a little bit. We call that milling. Right. And I would say that is also not treeing. That's, you know, the dog needs to be, the track's ending, but we also want to be careful because it's the it's nature of the hound to, they're scent hounds. You know, if they're traveling from that tree to come meet me or what have you, it's, uh, let's not be too hard on them either. You know, but just because they put their nose down close to the ground, that doesn't mean they've left the tree. Right. No, they're coming to me. It just happens to be, have their nose down a little bit. It's what they do when they put their nose down that you should be judging. And if you know hounds, that's not that difficult. If you're reasonable, you use a little common sense, your houndsman, they will tell you what they're doing. Sometimes they need to be minus, but more times than not, handlers are trying to get dogs like that minus for other reasons. That's right. Not for leaving a tree, but for trying to give them some minus points. So, so we're debunking that in the rule book. Yeah, there's two. There's two things that you always hear: the umbrella of a tree, umbrella of a tree, and putting the nose to the ground. Yep. If you're a houndsman, you know if a dog's left a tree or if it's still there at the tree. Call it for what it is, and not for what benefits you at that yep. given moment. Judge the dog for what it's doing when it's uh, when it's doing. Is it milling or is it finding another track, trying to work a different track? You know, or is it just simply put its head down while it's traveling between A and B, being B being the handler and then back to the tree? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good one, and it comes up quite a bit, and it happens sometimes. But the other thing that I when that's a question that we probably get. Every other week, somebody yeah. calls in and has that question about that. Right. Uh, but one thing I always used to kind of, from my own personal experience, is I thought that training a dog to not come back and meet me is one of the easiest things I can train. That and going back to the same tree we already scored. You know, and if uh, it doesn't take much of a houndsman to teach a dog not to do that, you know, and, and to not come back and meet me, that's not hard to train a dog to do that. Most that I've dealt with anyway hasn't been. Easy thing to train. Just doing that, if you're going to hunt in the night hunts, it sure eliminates a lot of the variances between judges that one may minus him way quicker than somebody else That's will. Right. But if I can have one that doesn't come back to me, I've eliminated all that That's right. issue. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it is a judgment call. It, is. it could vary it is. a little bit depending on who your judge is that given night actually found an article from back in the 90s, I think, that Todd Kellum wrote. You've probably read it a couple of times, too, where he talks about, you know, the, the person asking that question was a little more hasty than this one. He's, and then and Todd makes the point, if you're a judge, do you want to start having to carry a, a tape measure out yeah. in the woods? Do yeah. you want to take a yardstick? Do you need to have a clicker to see how yeah. many barks per minute a dog has or, you know, some kind of radar to tell you yeah. how far away dogs are getting in order to call timeout? You can make it so impossible to judge a cast if you if you make it too specific, just use your best judgment. We're all yeah. houndsmen out there. We're all sportsmanship. Call the dog for what it is. Yeah. All right. Next question. We covered that one well enough. I sure hope so. Yeah. Number four. I am seeing more and more casts filmed and scorecards posted before hunt deadlines. Can you talk about that? Well, we, we sure can. We sure can. Yeah, it's uh, obviously now in the social media age and with all the, you know, electronics out there that can give stuff at the, the touch of your finger, it's going to become more prevalent, something uh, to deal with more. But I think in order for us to answer this, we're going to break it down into a couple different categories here. And the first one is probably the most talked about one uh, just because uh, there, you see it 
more often these days rather than it used to never happen. And that's something that has to do with live live uh, coverage of, of a cast or an event. Um, so let's so let's say live streaming a cast on a social media platform or any streaming service. There may be some streaming services that me and you aren't even aware of that are out there. Um, and UKC's stance on that is absolutely not. Uh, pretty easy. Refer to Rule 8F, and that tells you that relaying any type of electronic messaging with reference to scores that is deemed detrimental to the hunt may result in suspension. We're not talking about just scratching it from the hunt. We're talking about possible suspension here. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's, it's a serious matter. And um, this doesn't only, it doesn't only limit the amount of information you can share, but also tells you you could face much harsher penalties. And it tells you whenever you're live streaming from the woods and our stance is that is detrimental to not only you on the cast, because you're disclosing your score to everybody out there at the click of their finger, but also everybody in your cast, your cast is at a disadvantage to the rest of the hunt especially when a lot of our hunts are score-based hunts. You know, you're talking about Autumn Oaks, Winter Classic, major breed day events. People can keep up with scores pretty simple. They're mm-hmm. not, even if you're not saying the scores over and over again, they're pretty sharp where they can tell who's tree and who's getting what kind of points, and you're giving them a major advantage when they know what your score is and what they need to shoot for on their cast. Yeah, that's true. And there are certain events like that. You know, an elimination event for that, you know, for one might not be as, that's not, it doesn't really matter there, but a lot of events, most events are, you might have high scoring dogs or they might be placing dogs. Absolutely. It could be, you know, back in the old days before we had cell phones and things like that, like trying to uh, texting and, and all that. If anybody tried to do anything, it would, you'd come back from your cast and maybe somebody would run in and, and see what the scores are for the high score for the night champion division, you know, because you had to have uh, the only one score a lot of times, you know, you had to have the high score to win, you know, or get a night champion win. Uh, you know, maybe somebody might uh, call their buddy out on a cast. Hey, they have, you know, night champion sitting at 500. You need a little better than 500. You know, that's what's here right now. Well, uh, here, enter uh, texting. That became even easier. Now right. the people can just, you know, without you even knowing it, they can kind of, you know, they know what scores you have here or kind of back and forth, you know, but yeah. that's what you don't want to influence any other cast, you know, right. and it, it could, it can work in various different ways. You know, I may be able to, let's say I text you and say, Hey, Trevor, you know, you need something better than 500, you know, and, and maybe that's your, or maybe I have 500 and I'm trying to protect my score and you try to help me protect my score. Cause we're buddies. All that would be, being influenced and considered detrimental to the hunt. But now the other thing is that you mentioned in there that the rule says that is deemed detrimental to the hunt. So who determines uh, whether it was detrimental? I think at the end of the day, if it's a complaint to UKC, we would be the ones to deem whether it was detrimental or not right. based on our investigation and our findings or not, not just just something standard, I guess, so to speak. Right. Is there some cases where it could be and other cases where it's absolutely not? Right, sure. Would it not been, doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, so for this live stream, and the last note I have on on that specific part of the question is, don't ever do that without getting pre-approval from us. Uh, for it, Especially, it, we could see this happening at maybe elimination-style event where scores don't matter. Uh, but uh, don't do it without pre-approval. Don't put yeah. yourself in that situation. Yeah, so here's the next question. Uh, what about taping a cast and posting videos after the fact? Yeah, so uh, we, we get this sometimes. We sometimes get emails of little snippets of videos from the field. Of, here's what happened here and, and that sort of thing. Is there a rule against it? N- not really. You won't find anything in the rule book about videoing something on the cast and, and using it after the fact to share widely for everybody to see. Um do I think that you should respect people's privacy and their rights if they don't want to be filmed? I absolutely think you should. Um, we're no, we're not lawyers here. We're not lawmakers. I'm not sure what the ins and outs of every state's regulations are, but sometimes, and you said this in a couple of different instances, uh, getting scratched from a hunt is the least of your worries whenever you're impeding on people's rights in different ways. And mm-hmm. this is a, this is a circumstance of that. And uh, I, the last thing, you know, it's common, you know, to, to see people, people who are videoing if i'm videoing a situation out in the woods i i have the ability to maneuver my camera and i think manipulate i know where you're view. going yep i know <laughs> and, where you're going with yeah, this maneuver and manipulate the view that the viewers are going to see to help it fit my narrative more so than an unbiased person would be if they were just filming the whole sequence so when i watch a video i'm not just going to jump to a conclusion and say oh wow well, here it is here it is on video straightforward here's what happened i want to know before I make any sort of uh, opinion on this, form any sort of opinion 
or make a declaration on this. I want to know what what led up to this. What's happened before this video that's got to this point? And what happened after the video to resolve it? And maybe what happened during the video that we didn't see that wasn't in the frame of the camera all before I formed my opinion. And I think that we should all be like that. Yep. Quit jumping to conclusions. Quit getting on sides before really getting the facts from what's going on out there. And that's why I think we should caution ourselves from doing this. And especially if we're the public and somebody posts something, let's caution ourselves before we jump on the bandwagon and start beating, beating someone down for it. You make some really good points about that. And I think it's hard to explain that really, or maybe understand that until you've seen some examples of that. Right. And you and I have seen some great examples of that. You show one video, it looks like this. It appears like this. You see a video of the same situation from a different angle. It looks different. It, it changes your opinion of what it goes, uh, you know, instant replay in, in uh, sport, major league sports is a good example of that right. football, be it football, baseball or whatever, you know, from one angle, it looks like the guy is definitely safe. We'll look at a different angle. No, he's definitely out, you know, yeah. just things like that. And the same is true for, it, it just wouldn't work well right. to use video, to use video all the, no, sometimes it does obviously, but not every time. That's right. So just because, you know, they say video never lies. Oh, well, guess what? It can. <laughs> it's it. Maybe it doesn't lie, but yeah. it also doesn't give a clear picture every time. Yeah, I kind of like the point you made up. We, we talked about it a little bit upstairs, and you made a point about uh, a NASCAR race. Yeah, and and seeing uh, maybe some guy being aggressive in yep. in turn two, and and the announcers are saying, "Man, I can't believe it!" But they didn't see the you know a lap or two before that. It what, was yep. Yeah, what happened before that? Yeah, sometimes yeah. It, you only get the tail end of it, and. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to form an opinion without all the facts. Yeah. So yeah, yeah hey, I, I think the uh, the the overall answer to that is, uh, hey, f forget about videotaping, you know, and and don't use that, and be careful what you you know what you're putting out there, and and that you're not infringing on anybody's uh, rights, you know. But now that, like you said, we have events that are advertised that we're going to uh, film the final cast and this and that. That's that's part of it. You right. entered that event, you that's know, right. that knowing that going into it, that's different. And then there's, I think there's one more part of it, uh, and that's what I'm going to get into now, and that's about po people posting scorecards or disclosing scores before the deadline has ended. Um, this is becoming more prevalent. I think people are wanting instant recognition and stuff. And, again, a rule ADEF uh, relaying in type of uh, electronic messaging with reference to scores that is deemed detrimental is posting a, a picture of my winning scorecard detrimental to the hunt Maybe it's more, more so detrimental to myself more than anything. Now everybody knows what to shoot for, but you know, at auto Mokes and the winter classic, we make it a point. Do not disclose your scores before the fact UKC in those events. We, we are telling you that it's detrimental to our hunt. We feel that it is disclosing your scores. That's why we keep them private to the end. And we ask you to do the same. Um, ultimately, you know, if the organization or the event official, if you're at a, a breed day hunt or a state championship and you post your score before the deadline or before all scorecards are in, you're kind of at their if if they think that what you're doing is detrimental to their hunt, then they're going to write you up. They're going to uh, yeah. turn in the misconduct form for us to fit to get all the facts and figure out if it is in fact detrimental to your hunt, and we'll proceed from that. I guess the last, the best thing I can tell you is uh, just you know be a little patient. People are you put out that you have a cast yeah. win. You don't have to tell what your score is right yeah. away. Post that later. You're still going to get your congratulations. You're still going to be able to tell everybody how good you did. May just have to wait a little bit, yeah. and at the end of the day, it's better to be safe than to be sorry. Yeah, and that's why we also have the rules for officials to keep those scorecards confidential until the deadline or until all casts have uh, have returned. There's a reason for that. Same reason, basically. You know, but yeah, you know, times have changed. You know, back in the day, it was different. You know, now we have the, all these uh, texting uh, capabilities, you know, and you need to think about that. You know, and here's the other thing that you and I see a lot. Uh, somebody's proud of their... Uh, of their uh, dog's performance. That's all good and dandy. But, you know, we also know that not every dog is going to, uh, every good dog is going to look great every night. That's true. Uh, you know, hey, uh, really, if the shoe's on the other foot, you may not really appreciate somebody showing how bad you spanked me this on this night. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's kind of in how you do that, you know, and be careful how you do that. All right, let's move on to question number five now. And uh, this is one that we're hearing more and more of every day, seems like. What can we do about dogs getting out of pocket? At this point, it's getting a little ridiculous. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to <laughs> take a stab at this one first? Go ahead. Well, yeah, hey, we can... don't bring one that goes out of pocket. I don't know. 
Yeah. No, you know, uh, we see that more and more where dogs are a little more independent. They a lot more independent than they used to be. The guys wanting to be deep and alone is the big thing. And, and with that, uh, we, we struggle. We, we all know that having uh, ample amount of land to hunt is getting less and less and dogs that go deeper and deeper does create issues. And I hate to think five and 10 years down the road, what it might look like if we continue down that trend, I think it's going to hurt us. Right. Uh, and it's going to become an issue. And I think one of the answers, the immediate band-aid, so to speak, is less than your hunt time. Well, if we're not careful, we, we're not going to have much of a competition if we're going to reduce our hunt time too much, you know. Right. So I think it's something, it's a, it's a good question, and it's, it's a topic that is uh, it's very debatable. Uh, there's a lot of controversy surrounding it, but, uh, um, yeah, you know, we certainly get it, you know. And even with the, the shorter hunting periods, uh, uh, some of the dogs that uh, we see out in the hunts are nearly impossible to, to, to keep reeled in, I guess, and— uh, uh, but I think you made you made some notes about this. You made some good ones, you know, with the rules that we have. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm telling you, a dog that hunts the area, small areas that you put them in, if a dog will just hunt that instead of, like a lot of them, try to get away from everybody else before they do much hunting, dog that does that and it is in a place where there's raccoons yeah. will destroy those dogs that uh, reach, go way out. And the other thing that I want to uh, bring up that needs to be in this conversation has to do with that we don't see enough of or that we see overlooked sometimes is if dogs get so far out in different directions that the judge has the right to call timeout or that's a reason to call timeout if you cannot judge dogs because they are trailing out of hearing in different directions. Now that is different than uh, one trailing over here and another one. We The only reason we know this one's way out of hearing over here is because we can see them on a a uh, telemetry right. system, but it, the word, the word says trailing, Yeah, you know, and we have that sometimes. Absolutely. You know, so yeah. I don't know. Just to, yeah, you mentioned rule seven about timeouts. I think that's probably the, about the only thing that we can highlight here to be, to help at all. You know, uh, rule seven tells us in two different places. I think there's two things that we can, we can point to here. The first one, or no, the second one's the one that you just brought up rule seven D. And that tells us that we can call timeout when dogs are trailing out of hearing in different directions, like you just said. But then there's also Rule 7A, which um, it can really help our guides. Let's think about our guides. Uh, when dogs are getting on a highway, trail onto posted land, or trail into a place where there is danger to dogs or hunters. Something to keep in mind, you know. Let's not ruin a guy's hunting uh, by dogs getting out and getting in someone's, losing his hunting spot over, over yeah, his hunt. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of guys, you know, like me, I know for me, you know, I have uh, permission to hunt here and, and, uh, but not over there, way over there, you know, but if we're not careful, why I, you're taking me right out of the guide pool. Cause I can't, I don't have enough spots to, to contain your dog. That's going to go a mile and a half or two miles, you know, from where we cut them loose, you know, yeah. but it, I think it's a real, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a topic that deserves some attention to talk about because I think in the, you know, just looking back for myself in 40 years, 35 years of hunting, you know, I had this amount of uh, land to hunt, you know, and yep. it's got 10 years later, I'm down to this and now I'm at this, you know, where are we going to be in five and 10 years from now? Right. You know, and, and I hate to think about having to hunt, uh, compete in pens and things like that, right. you know, but, uh, um, so I think, um, uh, I think it's something we should yeah, think about. Yeah, I want to make two points before we move on. And like I know this isn't the perfect answer. There's no perfect answer for this. And, you know, we get it a lot. And a lot of times I want to hear a little bit of feedback. Do you have some ideas to, to change this? I don't know. Hunt time, I think, whether you're hunting 30 minutes or, or two hours. I've hunted with some dogs recently that doesn't – you could hunt five minutes and those dogs will be two miles away. Right. And who has a two-mile section? Right. You know, not very many. Yeah. Um, and, and the second thing, I think, is um, when you're at a major event – and and you know your dog's two miles from the truck don't and you're and you're somewhere where you shouldn't be and you're having issues with landowners or you're not a great parcel instead of getting onto the guide and telling them how crappy they're hunting in let's be appreciative that somebody yeah. took you to a spot yeah. where you had the opportunity to even go there i'm thinking of our final cast of tlc and i'm not saying that there was any issues in tlc finals mm -hmm. as far as people complaining about the hunting but we were three miles from the truck when it ended you know i've complained mm -hmm. a little bit because i had to walk back but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you to the guide for yeah. for doug Kunda for taking yeah. us to his spot and we're three miles away from the truck and he has the ability to put us in a session like that 
There's not many people with that opportunity that's, that have that capability anymore. That's a very good point. But just to reiterate about our rules, really, our rules will be conducive to a dog that will go in and, and really hunt out a spot and able to Absolutely. tree, not pass up raccoons, you know, and tree those. And that type of dog is going to be hard to beat. Absolutely. You know, so maybe it's just a matter of like you, I think you made a note of it here, you know, some breeders starting to catch on to some of that a little bit, maybe. And, oh, absolutely. And it comes full circle a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, let's move on to question number six here. Moving right along. Yeah. Question number six. Are you required to have a non-hunting judge on a two-dog cast? Yeah. I think over the past three or four weeks, I've gotten three questions about this by the phone. It seemed like it popped up yep. all of a sudden. And I'm not sure where that uh, confusion is coming from, but it's always been the fact. And uh, I say always, ever since I've been hunting in UKC events, and you may tell me different, it's always been that you're only required to have a non-hunting judge on a one dog cast. If it's two, three, four dog cast, uh, you can you can assign a hunting judge to that. Is that always best case scenario? Let's in a two dog cast is always best case scenario. Well, if you have a, a judge that you trust, a hunting judge that you trust to put on the cast, absolutely it is. There's yep. no different. Well, it, it's not. You know, and you, you still have to have majority to plus a dog. So that yep. means both would have to see the raccoon and you have to have majority to minus a tree. So both would have to agree that, no, this is a minus tree. So, but, but I get it. You know, one of the, one thing that we hear sometimes that is not an option, and that is just to put another voting member in there that is not hunting a dog. That's not an right. option by the rule book. But the club there, again, the club may assign a non-hunting judge, but they do not have to. They're not required to. Right. Let's look to the rule book real quick. Um, that probably answers our question. There's a couple instances in the rule book that talks about where you must assign a non-hunting judge to a one-dog cast, and you won't see any language in our whole rule book about assigning non-hunting judges to a two-dog cast. So that completely debunks that uh, theory that's out there. But let's look at it. rule one. One rule C, uh, one C, right off the bat, deadline may be may only be extended if lone handler is required to go to the a beneficial for a non-hunting judge to finish the cast. Rule eight E, if only one handler remains, handler must return to master hound for a non-hunting judge. Um, even under the uh, hunting judge and non-hunting judge clarification after the rules, if you have the actual rule book number four reads, if only one caster, ca only one cast member remains, handler must return to master hounds for a non-hunting judge to complete cast. Uh, pretty straightforward there. But like you said, I did want to mention that just because you're in a two, three, or four dog cast doesn't mean that you're not going to have a non-hunting judge. Uh, the club has the ability or the event official has the ability to assign a non-hunting judge to any cast they seem de uh, they deem necessary. Mm -hmm. Let, that's rule 9B. tells us the club will have the option of hunting or non-hunting judges on all casts for each division. A non-hunting judge may be assigned to any cast at the discretion of Master of Hounds, Hunt Director, and or club officials. So don't be surprised if you do get one, but uh, you don't necessarily have to have one unless it's a one dog cast. Yeah, that's it. You know, another pet peeve of mine, I think it's easy for people to say, hey, you be, you, only because you're in this seat, and I'm going to say no. Uh, and that is this. If there's, if just you and I are out hunting, I may be disgruntled. Maybe I'm upset with my dog's performance. I'm kind of, you know, had enough of this or whatever, but stay with the cast. Right. Don't make you go back to get a non-hunting judge. Come on, help the club out. You know, that's your, the, at some point, if you hunt long enough, the shoe's going to be on the other foot, Absolutely. you know, or it, just because I don't agree with maybe some of the ways there's some things that you called and it's kind of my way of getting back at you. Hey, I'm leaving you. You got to go back and get you a non-hunting judge. Sorry for the inconvenience on you. That's just poor sportsmanship on my part. And that's a pet peeve of mine. And I, Honestly, I, I, I wish we had a rule that made everybody stay with the cast unless for reasonable reasons, but right. we don't. But uh, I think uh, sportsmanship goes a long ways here. I'll tell you, when we, you know, judging is uh, something that we, it's, it's something we think highly of our judges. When we assign judges, we think highly of those individuals, and we, we notice who doesn't, who doesn't yep. stay in. Who, That's, who right. Does. That's right. Well, Question seven. Yeah, moving on to the last yeah. one here. Uh, using 8 p.m. as the deadline to enter the event, what is considered late? So long as you're entered prior to 8.01 p.m., would it be considered on time? Yeah. Hey, this is one Todd Kellum wrote about a long time ago. I've written about it. I think you have, and we might have even stole some things from Todd and, and whatnot. I did, yeah. But here's, <laughs> I just heard it again this week. You know, somebody saying, well, uh, you know, the guy was, he wasn't back in at, uh, it was, it was 12.01 at that time he was late. No, that is, I'm going to argue that's not. That's not uh, the way you determine your deadlines. And it's as simple as this. If your entry deadline is at 8 o'clock, 
at eight o'clock, when the clock hits eight, not 801, it's eight o'clock, whoever's not in line to enter is going to be late. Right. It's that simple. Same with the return deadline. So let's say your return deadline is midnight. Uh, anybody that has not had the card in to you or is in line to turn it into you at midnight when the clock strikes midnight is late at that point, not midnight and just before one minute. You know, that would be your deadline would then be, you know, 1259. It's not it. It's midnight. Right. That simple. When it hits that point. Yeah. You're right. I don't know how we can make it much more simpler than that. Yeah. I have some other stuff on here, but I don't even know why we, we even really go into depth on it. It's yeah. if it, eight o'clock deadline at your event official is going to announce that deadline, the deadline or the entries are closed at eight o'clock on short. Yep. If you're not there in yep. line, you're late. Yeah. The logic of, of you being good until it's 801 is the wrong logic. We would not support that. Well, there you go. There's some good questions. I think those yeah. were some good questions. There's hey, some keep... there's some debatable ones, you know, and uh, and and we'll get some debate out of it. You know, folks listening to this don't maybe don't agree with it, and and I get it. You know, the the dogs hunting deep and alone. I think that's a real issue that I've thought for several years already. We need to kind of be thinking ahead a little bit. Are we doing ourselves a favor here? Especially if we we don't want to get too crazy with that. Absolutely. We hope you guys enjoyed these. Keep them coming. So after this break, we're going to take a look at the TOC qualifier list. Alan, we both had Dr. Pathfinder 2s now for a little while. What do you think about yours? I'm liking mine. One of the things I had the opportunity to now download a map of an area where I did not have service, and I've used it there, and it has worked flawlessly. I love it. Yeah, I love the crystal clear maps. I love that I never lose reception on my dog's collars anymore. Highly recommended by me as well. Dog Trip Pathfinder 2, the official GPS collar partner of UKC. And it feels like we just finished up our Tournament of Champions event this year, and we're already uh, halfway. halfway halfway through the qualifying season for the next year already. So. Hopefully nobody's dragging their feet out there because it'll be over before you know it. But uh, Not wait till December like some guys have found themselves and have to drive two states over to get that fifth win, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Save yourself some gas money. And you go get, it get it done now. Get it done now. So, hey, so this, uh, this, is a, of, this list is of reports processed on June 26th. I thought that was pretty accurately the halfway point just because of process and time. It always is a couple, a uh, few weeks after that when it comes about. Um, and right now we're sitting pretty good. You know, we're trending favorably over the past couple of years. We're at 362 qualified dogs as of the last update. Uh, last year at this time, we were around 330. Back in 21, we were around 350. So we're we're ahead of schedule here and, yeah. and we're doing good. We're seeing uh, good entries and it's it's good to see. Sports healthy looks like. So let's uh, let's break down that 362 a little bit. Uh, right now, black and tans are at 28. Blue ticks are at 35. English, 48. Three plots, five red bones, 227 walkers, 16 X-breads, and we don't have any leopards yet. Yeah. A good breakdown of breeds there. And the sex breakdown of 210 males to 152 females. And I always like to see the top performance states as far as number of qualified dogs and right now, somebody's challenging Kentucky's crown for the first time. Yeah, Indiana. Indiana is in first place right now with 41 qualified dogs. Uh, Kentucky comes in second with 37. We have Ohio with 30, Missouri with 28, and North Carolina with 24. So strong group of states there. No real surprises in that top five. Those are five states that are usually at or near the top of all of our numbers. Yeah, but really, numbers. hey, Kentucky's right there again. They're within striking distance. They are. And they'll they'll probably get out in the top again by the time it's all said and done. Seems like they always have, haven't they? Yeah, and honestly, they're probably going to have more winter events than you know some of yeah. Northern Indiana yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So we'll see how it turns out. We're challenging you, Indiana folks, to get those dogs qualified. Sounds like so. <laughs> Keep up there, knock Kentucky off the throne, maybe. But I thought it might be interested to go through some of the top performing dogs so far here at the halfway point. Uh, 23 cast wins already for one. <laughs> Mr. Tom Froze, I just had him on the phone today, you know, and he's proud of this. He's got a dog that's clicking, a little female is clicking, and he's proud of this. That's for sure, as he should be. Absolutely. You, you're talking about our our number one dog this year so far, champion Grand Night Champion 2, Swamp Thing Honey. Uh, she's a three-year-old Walker female on my Tom Froze and Stacy Smitherman of Pawnee, Oklahoma. And 23 cast wins. 
Yeah, this dog's off of Grand Night Champion Combs Wheeler, and the dam is uh, Mosier's White Ice. Yeah, that's a lot of cast wins that uh, he's racking up already this year. So yeah, I wonder if he's going for it. Is he going for Hall of Fame? Is that his I, yeah, going for performance points or what's I his? I don't know. Just making sure he's not going to be in for the qual or for the tournament of champions. Maybe he's trying to keep other people from getting qualified. Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, hey, when they're clicking, you roll. When they're uh, rolling, you keep rolling, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Get them while the getting's good. Yeah. Uh, second place dog at this point is champion Granite champion McPherson's All In Double Deuce. It's a black and tan male, only one year old. It's owned oh, by Charlie wow. McPherson of Four Dice, Arkansas. Yeah, sired by Wilson Holloman's Royal Cable Two and then Granite champion Wills or Wilson's Royal Black Sadie Two. Seventeen cast wins, black and tan. Good to see a young yeah, black and tan out here showing out. Yep. In third place, we got Grand Knight champion Big Timber Turbo. It's a one-year-old tree and walker male owned by Benjamin Lee Clawson of Roan Mountain, Tennessee. Yeah, off of a, a Hall of Fame uh, sire, Bennett Springs Joe, and the dame is Raglan's Wipeout Dot. Fifteen cast wins. Looks like we got a few tied for, or a couple here tied for fourth. Thirteen cast wins, yep. First one is Grand Knight champion, grand champion Thomas's Wipeout Ringo. It's a two-year-old tree and walker male Owned by Ora Thomas of Des Moines, Iowa. Dog is off a of Wipeout Hunter. That's a Grand Knight champion. And then a Grand Knight female. She's a swamp rat or a swap rat. Not sure if that's supposed to be swamp, but it's Ugh. registered as swap. Or is did, that a typo? Did in I your make part? a typo? I don't know. <laughs> now I'm curious. Yeah. Well, congratulations either way. Yeah. Um, and also tied for fourth with 13 cast wins is Grand Knight champion Charles Tree Singing Skybo. Uh, Skybo is a one year old Tree and Walker female owned by Ryan Charles. Of Van Sant, Virginia. Yeah, off a of Grand Knight Champion Three Mountaintop Slow Talking Bow, and the dam is Grand Knight Sky's the Limit. Our uh, top reproducer right now, Slow Talking Bow, with another another nice young dog here. Yep. Looks like got one dog in sixth place. That's Champion Grand Knight Champion Two Hayes Cousin Charlie. There's another black and tan male here, six years old. This one is. And it's owned by Jeff and Jordan Brown of Bearden, Arkansas. Collins Joe is the sire. That's a Grand Knight champion. The dam is also a Grand uh, Grand Champion Black Iron Darla. 12, 12 cast wins. Yep. And now we got seven dogs here tied for seventh place with 11 cast wins each. And there's some nice dogs in here. Let's yeah. let's go through them quickly and, and tell about these dogs as well. So um, the first one is Grand Knight champion Emmons Half Pint Cricket. It's a four-year-old tree and walker female. Owned by Rick Fletcher of Vincennes, Indiana. Sire is Smoking Mountain Half Pint. Uh, that's that junkie dog. One of our grandmasters that that's one right. of the first years named Junkie was his call name. Half Pint. Uh, and the name is Gnaw Hot Spice. Next next one here is another another dog from that area. Same area as Junkie. That's Night Champion Champion Breaking the Bank. The one-year-old tree and walker male. Owned by Kevin Cable Jr. and Fred Thoenis of Connersville, Indiana. Yeah, this dog is off of uh, Cable's uh, dual grand money in the bank, and the dam is Bad Habit Bella. Next one here is Night Champion Champion Smoking Aces Talk to Me Goose, HTX. A one year old English male owned by Justin Hofstetter of Pleasant Hill, Missouri. Main Street dog off of Main Street Mr. Clutch, and the dam is Smoking Aces Dealing with Karma. The dual grand female. Next one here, champion, night champion, Murphy and Airings, Iron Man. One-year-old tree and walker male owned by Ryan and Lucas Murphy and Kurt Airing of Bonaterra, Missouri. It's off of uh, All Grand Track Man and Grand Knight Wipeout Lima Rita. We have uh, champion, Grand Knight champion four, Split Creek Poseidon, HTX. It's a six-year-old English male Owned by Kane Taylor of Elida, Ohio. This dog is off a of dual Grand Taylor's Rasputin, and the dam is Clemens's Main Street Red Katie. I think we saw this dog in the top 20 of the world finals last year in Tennessee. Sure did. This dog's yep. been on a good yep. run the past yep. couple of years. Yep. Next one here, night champion Canada Runs Blue Boom. It's a two-year-old blue tick male owned by Kevin Clark and William Wallace of Parksburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and the dog is off of uh, Walston's Blue, uh, Blue Big Country, and the dam is Night Champion Blue Creek Saturday Night Special. And rounding out the list of dogs we're going to be talking about this week for TLC qualifiers, top performing dogs so far this year, Night Champion Abbott Stylish Patch, the three-year-old tree and walker female owned by Kenneth Abbott of Tariff, West Virginia. 
Yeah, and this dog is off of uh, Granite Cochran's Hardwood Dock, and the dam is Granite Abbott's Stylish Susie here. So, yeah. Good list of dogs with yeah. some good dogs in there. we got a long ways to go yeah. yet. You know what I'd like to see? It's too bad we can't track uh, how many events these dogs have been in, just kind of see what their percentage is. You know, and folks have asked us about that. came up, I think, just this last week. Somebody asked me, and it would uh, it would take a lot more processing on our end, you know, but it would be kind of a cool stat to see, you know, just what their percentage looks like. But, you know, I got to point one thing out. There's one, uh, there's, a, there's somebody missing on this list that it seemed like last year he was always on the list. Whatever happened to Drew Estep? Where's he at? What happened? I don't know. I, he I guess fell it, off the edge of the rock here, it looks like. <laughs> I guess we finished Rolo to the Hall of Fame and the next one's not ready <laughs> yet. Huh? I don't know. Yeah, I, I bet I have an idea what's going on with that boy. <laughs> well, hey, congratulations to everybody we talked about. We sure hope you enjoyed the episode with the, the TOC rundown and also the rule stuff. Be sure to bookmark this one so you can go back and listen to it a, a few times and make sure those get hammered home but uh yeah and if you don't agree with everything that we talked about there especially on the rule stuff or whatever that's fine but uh hey it's some some good stuff good topics thank you for listening to the ukc hunting ops podcast be sure to give us a follow so you don't miss any of our new episodes or content 